I now call to order the Society's 2419th meeting. In the 149th year since its founding, on March 13, 1871. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by Jack Gilbert in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., including our members and friends around the world who are watching the live stream of tonight's meeting on PSW Science's YouTube channel. We will begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2418th meeting and the lecture by Ellen Stofan on Venus, our hot house neighbor. We'll then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. When the Q&A session is done, I will present a thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, thank those who make PSW possible, and adjourn the meeting to the social hour. First, join me in thanking the sponsors of the 2019-2020 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization, in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous sponsor who was asked to remain anonymous. Tonight's lecture is also sponsored by a generous donor who has asked not to be named. He may be somewhere in the audience, and we would like to say thank you to him for sponsoring tonight's lecture. Please also thank our sponsors of another type, the volunteers who have dedicated their time, expertise, and care to carrying on the work of the society without compensation, serving science and the public, and maintaining the almost 150 years of traditions of the society. Especially tonight, please join me in thanking one of the members of the General Committee and the crew who keep this organization running and growing, Connor Nixon. <laughs> Connor is PSW's very own rocket man who serves PSW on the General Committee and often runs a camera for the live stream and video recordings. And he's on camera two tonight back there. Thank you very much, Connor. I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected to the society. Anthony Shinella, an officer with the National Intelligence Council interested in computer science, astrophysics, particle physics, astronomy, and paleontology, who comes to PSW through the inestimable MIT Alumni Association. David Holtzman, a technologist with Global POV, interested in computer science, large-scale information systems, unique approaches to identity management and cryptography, who comes to PSW through meetings at the Cosmos Club. And tonight's speaker, Jack Gilbert, whose background and interest will be clear to you in part from tonight's proceedings. Please join me in welcoming them to membership. And there is a signed reprint of volume one of the PSW Bulletin for all new members. And if you have not received yours as a new member, please see me after the lecture and I will be happy to give one to you. And if you purchased a PSW ribbon, Please see Anne McQueen at the way back there at the ribbon table to pick it up. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2418th meeting and the lecture by Ellen Stofan on Venus, our hothouse twin, delivered to the Society on January 24th, right here in the Powell Auditorium. Thanks, Larry. Hi, good evening, everyone. I hate to sound a little repetitious, but on January 24th, 2020, in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., President Larry Milstein called the 2,418th meeting of the Society to order at 8.01 p.m. He announced the order of business, that the evening's lecture would be live streamed on the internet, 
and welcomed new members to the society. The minutes of the previous meeting were then read and approved. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Ellen Stofan, John and Adrienne Mars, director of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Her lecture was entitled, Venus, Our Hothouse Neighbor. Stofan said that the 20th century's accepted understanding of our solar system arose from limited data and that our understanding of planets is still in its infancy. The notion of, quote, habitable zones, end quote, that a planet's proximity to a star determines the conditions for liquid water and thus the planet's habitability has been accepted for decades. But despite Earth's location in the habitable zone, it has not always been habitable. Further, the currently non-habitable planets of Mars and Venus are in the accepted habitable zone for our solar system. Yet Titan, far from this zone, has open liquid bodies of methane and other liquid hydrocarbons. Habitability is therefore not constant and may not be limited to proximity from a sun. Comparing volcanoes in our solar system reveals differences in planetary development. Venus is marginally smaller, made of mostly the same materials and formed near Earth. Yet, it currently has a 243-day retrograde rotation, 90 bars of pressure on the surface, no ocean, and a carbon dioxide atmosphere. And while its closer proximity to the sun should only cause its surface temperature to be 10 degrees Celsius greater than Earth, Venus has a surface temperature of 400 degrees, apologies, 460 degrees C. The lack of biosphere should make Venus ideal for studying its geology, but the Venusian atmosphere makes surface observation difficult. The only visible wavelength images we have of the planet's surface are from Soviet Union landers that each perished after approximately an hour after landing. In the 1990s, NASA's Magellan mission used radar to coarsely map Venus's topography. Magellan revealed Venus is covered in volcanoes, yet the planet does not have plate tectonics, illustrated by the lack of any pattern in volcano location. Stofan believes some of the volcanoes are active, but said Magellan lacked time or ability to identify such activity. Stofan then discussed lava flows on Venus, some of which exceed 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers in length which may reveal the rate at which greenhouse gases were introduced into the atmosphere. These flows and Venusian volcanoes also indicate hotspots, challenging the current geological consensus that hotspots are dependent on the existence of plate tectonics. The shapes of Venusian volcanoes are also unusual. Stofan showed many pictures of various volcanoes and highlighted the corona shape unique to Venus, where they can be thousands of kilometers across and occur in long chains. In some places, scientists estimate the planet's surface to be as young as one million years old. Together with relatively few impact craters on Venus, Stofan says the data supports her active volcano hypothesis. Scientists have identified potential ancient subduction zones on Venus's surface. Some contend these zones are evidence that Venus formerly had plate tectonics. But, Stofan said, the zones may have been caused by an ocean early in Venusian history. Stofan said two dominant theories have emerged. First, that everything we observe on Venus happened 750 million years ago, and a catastrophic overturn of the planet's interior caused massive floods of lava. And second, that active volcanoes have slowly developed on the planet's surface. Both models have footing in the existing data. Further exploration is required to resolve the competing theories. Concluding, Stofan explained how deciphering Venus's history may cast light onto potential developments in climate change here on Earth. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.58 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the meeting to the social hour. Temperature, nine degrees C. Weather, cloudy. Attendance here in the Powell Auditorium, 100, 101, and viewing through the live stream on PSW Science YouTube channel, 40. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary.
Thank you, James. Are there any quick corrections or comments on the minutes? Uh, hearing none, I'll accept a motion from a member to accept the minutes as read. So I have a couple, and do I have a second from a member? I have more than a couple. All members in favor? All members opposed? The minutes will be accepted as read unanimously and posted to the website in due course. We now turn to tonight's lecture on the World Microbiome Project and Integrated Microbiomics. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Jack Gilbert. Jack is professor in the Department of Pediatrics and professor in the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. He also is chief scientific advisor for the company 4INO. And before coming to UCSD, he was professor of surgery and director of the Microbiome Center at the University of Chicago. Jack uses molecular analysis to test fundamental hypotheses in molecular eco microbial ecology. He co-founded the Earth Microbiome Project and the American Gut Project to advance research in these areas. He also founded BiomeSense, Inc., to produce automated microbiome sensors for clinical research. He is an author on over 300 scientific publications and book chapters on microbial ecology, and he is the founding editor-in-chief of M Systems Journal. He also co-authored Dirt is Good, a popular science guide to the microbiome and children's health. Among other honors, Jack was awarded the Altemeyer Prize of the Surgical Infection Society and the Pierce Prize of the Society for Applied Microbiology. In addition, he has been listed as one of the brilliant 10 by popular scientists, one of the 50 most influential scientists by Business Insider, and one of the 40 under 40 by Crane's Business Chicago. He earned his PhD at Le Lever and Nottingham University in the UK, and he did postdoctoral work at Queen's University in Canada. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture, and join me in welcoming Jack to the podium. Very good. Oh, there we go. Oh, very loud. Um, so uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the honor. Um, uh, I've been to DC a lot. I absolutely love it. I am British um, by accent and uh, origin. However, I've lived in America for 10 years. Um, so I'm, I'm applying for my citizenship. Um, hopefully, it will be successful. Yeah, we'll see. I know. <laughs> I am. I am. I know a lot about American history, um, and I've studied the history of this building and of this society, so um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. It's great to be in such illustrious competition. Um, I do have a rather, uh, I've changed the title of the slides, because uh, as an academic, I'm allowed to change things at the last minute. That's, that's the rule. Um, and also, I have a rather strange um, uh, um, assignment. I'm in pediatrics and oceanography, which makes me, I think, the world's first pediatric oceanographer or <laughs> oceanographic pediatrician. Uh, Baby dolphins, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it really does talk to the fact that my research and my interests are incredibly diverse. Uh, we're currently in my lab running around 47 independent research projects that are spanning everything from uh, habitable worlds uh, to uh, indoor environments in space to the bottom of the ocean and octopuses um, to uh, mangrove swamps and then to pediatric disease, to neurological disease, surgical infections, uh, you name it, right? Uh, which gives, uh, I, I think the, the, the main reason for the, the immense diversity is because uh, we work in microbes and microbes are literally everywhere. There is a, a plethora of microorganisms on the planet. I think I heard the number like, uh, one time 10 to the 31 phage, right, uh, on the planet. Well, there's, a, there's only tenfold less bacteria, so it's one time 10 to the 30 bacteria. Um, uh, that's more stars, uh, more bacteria on the planet Earth than there are stars in the known universe. So I'm following an astrophysicist, I guess, um, uh, in the previous lecture. 
So this quote might be a little bit uh, inappropriate, uh, but uh, from my colleague Julian Davis, who stipulated once the diversity of the microbial world is catalogued, it will make astronomy look like a pitiful science. I apologize for that, but we do rather tend to refer to expensive restaurant bills as astronomical. I think they should be microbiological, or at least biological. Um, however, I have tried this in many restaurants, and it didn't go down very well, just blank stares, so who knows. Um, but it does talk to the immense diversity. Uh, we are incredibly, we work with NASA a lot, and we're incredibly interested about, oh, it's that one, isn't it? I did it, I did it, she told me not to, and I did it. Uh, we're very interested about the, the impact of, uh, of the information we can understand about how microbes function and survive on this planet, and the implications for life on other planets. If we're gonna find life on other planets, it's gonna be microbial. Um, I, I will almost uh, bet my uh, uh, dollar on it. And I only have one, so it's a, it's a pretty severe bet. Um, uh, but uh, we work a lot in things like the built environment, so buildings. The building you're sitting in is very old, um, but it's a, an example of enclosing ourselves from the outside. Uh, it's a construct that we created for ourselves to make our environment more comfortable, more stable, um, and it's been highly successful at doing that. Uh, but we also examine what pressure, what evolutionary selective pressure, this environment sh uh, has that shapes microbial life. Because I will guarantee it's doing it. And if it's doing it to microbes, it's also doing it to us. So those kinds of paradigms become incredibly interesting. What can we say about how we are structuring the world and its impact upon the function of that world? Those things become uh, really interesting questions. So I should probably have led with this, but what is a microbiome? What do microbes do? What, what are they in our construct? Well, a microbiome is just an ecosystem, right? Like a rainforest um, or a prairie. Um, it's a collection of life in a contained environment, although contained is somewhat morphic, right? It blends. Uh, but we like to refer to a microbiome as the sum total of bacterial, viral, fungal life in any environment, right? Uh, be that environment this room or your skin or your intestine, or a coral reef, or the uh, soils of the Serengeti, it's irrelevant. Those are all microbiomes. And we have the opportunity and the honor to be able to study those environments in incredible detail. Uh, thanks to uh, new technologies which have come around in the last 20 years, we are able to continually refine our understanding of those environments and really start to use that information to transform our ability to manipulate those ecosystems uh, to uh, further resilience, resistance, uh, sustainability. Um, and when I can apply those words, rather unusually maybe, uh, to medicine, to the application of uh, resilience, resistance, sustainability in medical practice. How can we make our bodies more resilient to infection, uh, more resistant to stress, more uh, sustainable in the long term? Um, and it's, it's telling, I'm not an MD. I actually started out my career working in butterfly ecology, uh, somehow stumbled into biochemistry via a route of microbiology and, and then ended up as a, uh, um, a director of a microbiome institute. Um, I have literally no idea what I really do, but I'm, I'm working on it. But the, the paradigm is interesting, right? It's an opportunity to really explore how um, we can apply ecology, the study of the natural world and its connectivity, to medicine. Medical practice has been um, uh, highly segregated for a long time. You look at the National Institutes of Health. Is there anyone who works at the National Institutes of Health here? I'm just gonna, there's a couple, yeah? Hey, I love you guys, the funding's great. But, um, thank you. But the, uh, the paradigm is also each of the individual institutes focuses on one set of diseases or an organ, right? We, we deal with it in in selective groupings. And that, that relationship is fantastic until you really understand the connectivity between all the different components of health. And so there's an opportunity to bridge all of those different disciplines, cardiac biology, neurobiology, uh, everything from epidemiology all the way through to infectious disease. Understanding the paradigms of how all of those things are connected is the job of an ecologist. And so um, it was my honor to be the first ecologist elected to, uh, to uh, coordinate programs at the Department of Surgery, University of Chicago, 
Um, I, I'm grateful that I'm not the first ecologist to be elected into the Department of Pediatrics, University of California, San Diego, but it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to apply a new discipline and a new way of thinking into a, an otherwise um, uh, uh, fantastic op, uh, discipline. So microbes are incredibly important. And, and as, a, as a species, I, I could wax lyrical for, uh, I was only given an hour, so I could wax lyrical for ages about the impact in agriculture, the, the role of microbes in mediating the health of animals, uh, the distribution of microbes through the oceans and through the atmosphere. It's, it's a phenomenally interesting amount of mathematical uh, systems biology that we can actually apply in those systems. But I'm going to focus on humans because I'll wager that most people in this room are human. Okay, Maybe not you, sir, but, you know, sorry. Um, but that relationship between you and this material will make it easier to uh, come on board with the ideologies which I'm going to push forward. Um, you have an immune system. Every single person does. There's rudimentary immune systems in some of our closest known non-vertebrate relatives, like uh, the, the chordata, uh, a chordata, like uh, Siona, um, uh, the sea squirt, right? They have a rudimentary immune system. We've developed it over millions of years to control our exposure, our relationship with the microbes around us. We are, uh, in essence, a combination of two microbes. That was our evolutionary history. And that re-derivation of our existence in the sea of other microorganisms out there meant that we were going to be perpetually, perpetually exposed to the microbial world. And we had to deal with that. We couldn't just let them take the resources from us, right? So the, the paradigm was always that the immune system is uh, uh, an army a war machine set to um, protect us, to defend us against the great swarming hordes of, of microbes that want to make us sick, right? Um, I, I will posit um, with reasonable efficacy that it's actually a National Park Service. Oh, I did it again. She's going to kill me with the back there. Um, it's a National Park Service. It's more like a gardener. It's there to make sure that the bacteria we want to keep around stay around and the bacteria we want to get rid of are weeded out, much like any gardener should. Um, a, a National Park Board and a National Park Service have to maintain the ecological stability of this contained environment. You, know, you can't just rely on natural income and outcome when you're surrounded by uh, agricultural land. So you have to be able to manage that environment. And the immune system does exactly the same thing. So the microbes in our body are managed by a, well, managed by a National Park Service. I, I will get it eventually. I'm, I'm getting there. Na managed by a National Park Service, which manipulates and maintains the ecosystem stability of that ecology inside us. And that's what keeps us healthy. Um, and this is, a, this is very important. It will, it will transgress throughout the rest of the lecture. But uh, the National Park Service and, oh, sorry, the immune system, so I've got lost in my own ideology, the immune system and the microbiome are two sides of the same coin. If something disrupts, the immune system, uh, we take uh, an immunosuppressant, it will disrupt the microbes that live inside us because the immune system controls what grows and what thrives. If we disrupt the microbiome, we take an antibiotic, uh, it will alter the immune system because the microbiome produces small molecules which shape the health of the immune system. So it's a two-way street. It's a bi-directional relationship. And once we start to disentangle that, understand the paradigm of that bi-directional relationship, we can start to produce actionable um, uh, interventions that will actually have an impact in a targeted way. So we study the microbiome in uh, much the same way as a genomicist would study genes and uh, genetic relationship to disease using something we've termed microbiome-wide association studies, an MWAS, right? Much like a, a GWAS, a genome-wide association study, where you would look at allelic gen gene variants in a population and, um, you know, you'd all have the gene which codes for awesomeness and you would all have the gene which codes for not, or, oh, no, this isn't, that's not going to go well, uh, for other lovely people, right? That bidirectional relationship, we'd see that genetic difference. We do the same with microbes. We look at which bacteria differ, which genes and functional traits in those microbiome in your bacteria differ, and also what products they produce, what chemical metabolites those microbiomes synthesize, and how those differ between different traits in a population. And that relationship helps us to really disentangle how these environments uh, shape our health. 
And it's, uh, if you think about the microbiome, I often think about it as a chemical factory, right? It really is. Microbes are wonderful chemical factories. They produce an enormous array of chemical diversity. So for example, doing it again, microbes can produce acetate. So uh, acetate, short chain fatty acid, very small molecule, is produced from the fermentation of fiber. When you consume your fiber in the morning, um, like you're supposed to, I hope all of you are consuming your recommended daily intake of minimum of 35 grams a day. I doubt any of you are doing that. Does anyone ever manage 35 grams a day? Probably not. Oh, oh one, one, <laughs> one. Who was very nervous about saying one. <laughs> but that's, that's exactly what we should do. You should try and eat approximately 30 different species of plant a day. And remember that uh, uh, Brussels sprouts and cabbage are the same species. So remember what a species is. All right, but um, when you, when you consume uh, fiber, the bacteria fermented in the colon and they produce short chain fatty acids. One of those is acetate. And acetate is a small enough molecule that when it gets into the bloodstream, it's able to pass the blood brain barrier. And there are host receptors on host cells in the blood brain barrier that maintain um, a, an ability to um, augment the synthesis of a hormone called leptin, which controls your satiety. So when you eat enough fiber, bacteria in your gut produce a chemical which changes how hungry you are, driving down your hunger levels and stopping you from wanting to snack. Uh, uh, you know, uh, flippancy aside, that's a fundamental link that we can now manipulate. In fact, controlling overeating, one of the best ways we can do that, and, and uh, we do this in, in children with hyperphagia, uh, these are children that w can't stop eating. They find it uh, neurologically, uh, behaviorally impossible to stop consumption, and they will actually hurt people to get food. Um, I know a lot of people like that that don't have hyperphagia, but this is, a, this is an actual uh, uh, disease condition. The best way we can treat that, uh, that, that neurological disease is to feed them elevated levels of fiber, because it will actually actively control their, uh, their, uh, uh, their overeating response. We also know that microbes can produce things like uh, amino acids. Uh, in fact, uh, the essential amino acids, some of which we get in our diet, uh, but that our body cannot produce, we cannot synthesize them, um, uh, are produced by bacteria in the gut. So bacteria in the gut produce the entire array of all 20 amino acids. And what we've actually found is that children, we have a clinical trial running in um, three sub-Saharan African countries um, and in um, the Seychelles and uh, Jamaica in the, uh, in the Caribbean. And in those populations, we look at children that suffer from uh, protein-restricted diets. They're not getting enough protein in their diet, right? And that can cause stunting, growth stunting, and also neurodevelopmental delay. But it's, it's a spectrum. Just because it can cause that doesn't mean it does. Some children do absolutely fine on a low-protein diet. And what we found is that the children who do absolutely fine on a low-protein diet, their microbes are producing excess levels of protein, amino acids in this case, which supplement the body's requirements for protein. So one, one fact, the reason you get stunting, if you don't consume enough protein, your body will start to retrograde, degrade the muscle tissue in your body to meet an equilibrium with the intake of protein. So you don't need to maintain enough protein if you reduce the protein. So you, you know, if you've not got enough in, you just get rid of some of your excess need. In this case, those children don't have that side effect because the bacteria are supplementing that supply. This um, We've actually found, uh, working with uh, some fantastic research up at Cedar sinai and in the University of Accra in Ghana, that we can supplement children's diets with uh, cellulose. Very cheap plant-based substrate. When we give them the cellulose, it stimulates the growth of bacteria in the intestine, which elevate the production of essential amino acids and other amino acids, supplementing protein intake. And in those children that receive cellulose um, as, a, as a dietary supplement compared to control, uh, we see a significant reduction in, um, in uh, growth uh, uh, retardation and, uh, and mental delay. So those, those things are potentially fascinating. We also know um, that bacteria can degrade drugs, like acetaminophen. Um, acetaminophen, uh, the most commonly available, uh, uh, apart from ibuprofen, um, uh, um, uh, painkiller that's available on the market. It also kills around uh, 40,000 Americans every year uh, due to overuse, mainly due to cirrhotic activity. It causes liver cirrhosis in certain individuals. Turns out that high, very high probability that if you're um, developing liver cirrhosis from the overconsumption of acetaminophen, is because you have a bacteria 
in your intestine, which is breaking down the acetaminophen, augmenting it, breaking down as well, modifying it, and augmenting it with a sulfate moiety, which changes uh, the pattern of um, degradation in the liver, causing cirrhotic activity. So now we have a, a, microbiome, a potential microbiome interaction between a drug, which in certain people who have that bacterial species um, can lead to a life-threatening condition. We also know that bacteria can break down, I'm doing it again, can break down primary bile acids into secondary bile acids. And in that situation, we're talking about bile acids produced in your intestine to help break down fats uh, by your body. Bacteria also use it as a food source. If you have a lot of secondary bile acids and not many primary bile acids, which you should do if your microbes are breaking them down, um, you'll have a significant reduction in your likelihood of developing a C. difficile infection if you're infected with C. difficile spores, C. diff, a common, uh, well, not so common, but uh, a highly virulent form of uh, gastrointestinal pathogenesis. Um, when we give somebody, I will wager, let me do the numbers, uh, about um, uh, 12 people in this room probably have a spore or spores of C. diff in your intestine. And, and um, I'll wager, because most of you are sitting here still, you're, you're not infected with C. difficile infection. And I'll wager that's because the bacteria in your intestine are controlling those spores and stopping them from germinating through their metabolism of primary bile acids, secondary bile acids. If I gave you an antibiotic, it would eradicate those microbes, breaking down those bile acids, leading to a significant elevation in primary bile acids, which is a triggering factor, causing the seeds of C. diff to spore, to grow, and then you get the infection. And unfortunately, once it takes hold, it's very hard to get rid of. Um, however, um, in about uh, 600 AD in China, um, I'm going back a little bit, but bear with me, uh, we, uh, um, we and some of my colleagues, um, no, the uh, Chinese ancient medical uh, practice was to take uh, the fecal slurry from an infant, pure of spirit and mind, for whatever reason, and ferment it overnight in an earthenware jar, and then provide that as a liquor for the uh, patient to drink who had chronic diarrhea. All right? So if you had C. diff, you'd, you'd consume fermented baby feces, um, which is also the name of my next album. Um, in, in the context of this, they called it yellow soup, and it was highly effective. So effective, it was used for almost a thousand years in Chinese medical literature. It dropped out of use, um, uh, and we've never really adopted it. Although in the 1950s, a doctor in the Midwest started to apply it and found it to be highly effective, but he was still ridiculed by the, uh, the established medical community um, as being a little bit ad hoc. But it turns out um, through a recent spate of clinical trials in the last 10 years that we can maintain almost um, 85 to 90 percent um, recovery rates, that's no readmission into hospital after six month period after dosing, uh, with what we now term as not yellow soup, but a fecal microbiome transplant. We'll take feces from a healthy individual and we'll either um, spray it into the colon uh, via a, um, an, uh, um, a, um, an enema, or we'll do a nasal gastral intestinal um, uh, pipe in and place the microbial community in there. Moderately unpleasant, slightly invasive, highly effective. Um, in the treatment of C. difficile infection. It's not a magic bullet, however. When we looked at it in uh, other diseases, uh, like uh, Crohn's colitis, it wasn't effective in treating Crohn's colitis patients. Um, we assumed that was a gastrointestinal abnormality as well, didn't turn out to be. Um, uh, but it does appear to be highly effective in treating IBD, although the clinical evidence is still um, uh, being developed to prove true efficacy. Currently, the FDA regulates fecal microbiome transplants, um, and uh, the, the only one that's fully approved, um, although you still need an IRB to perform the operation, is uh, C. difficile treatment. And C. difficile treatment because it's so effective. Ooh, I'm having my photo taken. Um, Jorge Luis Borges, I don't know if any of you are literature fans out there, fantastic South American. I know we have an um, uh, Argentinian uh, in the room. So, um, wonderful author. All of his books um, had uh, connectivity in them. What happened to somebody in one novel would affect somebody in another novel. The connectivity was always there. Everything touched everything. I don't know if Jorge Luis Borges actually ever said that, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase him in this context. Um, and that's the same is true for ecology. The connectivity of this system is huge. The microbes in the body will fundamentally influence health, right? It's not the only thing which fundamentally influences health, but it's a major component of the system. And if we can 
understand it better, we'll be able to um, augment our current healthcare system. Every single person in this room is microbially unique. So far, we've sequenced over 200,000 people. We've never found a microbial doppelganger. Doesn't mean they don't exist. And in fact, we work with the National Institutes of Justice in a program called Microbial Forensics, where that question comes up a lot. If we're going to um, actually criminally uh, or in, uh, um, indicate someone as being a criminal because of a microbiome sample, we better be damn sure that that sample can't be used to incriminate someone wrong because the criminal injustice system, and I'll call it criminal injustice system in this country, has incarcerated way too many people for completely the wrong thing, and too many innocent people are away. That needs to be dealt with, um, and I think the way to do that is to provide better evidence-based solutions in order to provide um, the law enforcement agencies with opportunities. I'll get off my soapbox, but it's interesting. Even identical twins don't have the same microbiome. Uh, it's, it's, it's because of the nu numerical nature of this. This is a mathematical uh, statistical problem. There are just too many subvariants. Every single person in this room has between 500 and 1,000 species. That's huge, right? And what you are born with comes in part from your mother, but also from the exposure to people and things around you. So even an identical twin, even if they're dressed in the same outfit, do not generate the same exposure pattern over time. So they're going to end up with a different microbial community. And that becomes important because people generally have these very, very, um, in, in a clinical trial setting, have this paradigm that we, we find it very difficult to um, uh, identify different patients and stratify them into different populations. With the microbiome, it's, it's actually possible to start to identify stratification efforts which can be highly effective. I'll show you those a few in a minute. One of those is in very basic biometric patterns, things like cholesterol level, HDL, I'm doing it again, lactose consumption, waist circumference. I can tell your waist circumference within 83% accuracy by looking at the bacterial community in your stool using a highly expensive test. Yes, I don't need to, I can use a tape measure, but it's still fun to do it, right? Um, body mass index, your glycemic status, your glycemic response to different diets can be predicted based on the types of bacteria in your intestine. And a group out of... Uh, um, uh, out of Israel from the Wiseman Institute have launched that as a commercial enterprise for treating uh, pre-diabetics and diabetics, providing them with advice on which foods you as an individual should consume in order to maintain consistency in your blood sugar. So you don't get spikes and troughs, which are the major problem, especially in pre-diabetic populations, pushing them into type 2 diabetes. The major take home from this slide is that the bacterial community in, um, here in green um, is often better at predicting some of these classic cardiometabolic uh, variables um, as uh, more than so than genetics. Combination of microbiome and genetics, uh, the two of them together, when we have that information, we can describe a lot more variants in the population than we can with either one of them alone. But in often part, the microbiome can be at least significantly greater at describing the variants in that population as genetics. That's phenomenal, right? But it's kind of intuitive when you understand that the microbiome is a fingerprint of what's going on in your life. If you drink heavily and you eat McDonald's every day, you're going to have different bacteria to someone that eats a lot of fiber, right? Yeah, it's good. You're going to say you eat a lot of McDonald's now. <laughs> but anyway, it, these things are important. Um, and, and we can break that down. We can go far deep down into what that actually means, right? Uh, we often refer to people who are getting sick uh, with a microbiome disease as being dysbiotic. And yet, what does dysbiosis mean? What's its relevance in this context? It just means a breakdown in the ecology of the system. The problem with that statement is that defining it becomes incredibly difficult. Uh, here's a, a wonderful definition from some of my colleagues, Bin Los et al. Um, this is uh, homeostasis here on the left, where we have um, a very a low oxygen potential referenced in a light blue color in the lumen of the gut. That low oxygen potential is promoting the growth of bacteria which do not like oxygen. Luckily, the bacteria that do not like oxygen are the ones that ferment fiber um, and produce a lot of the compounds which our body requires. One of those compounds is a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. Butyrate is a, a food substrate for beta oxidation activity in the colonocytes that line your gut. If you produce enough butyrate, you can actually mature the colonocytes and create these two little lines here that are called tight junctions. They allow the cells that line your gut to be to adhere to each other and stop things from leaving your gut and getting into your body, which is obviously bad. So in this context, you have a system in homeostasis because 
a mature colonocyte consumes oxygen and stops it from getting into the gut. So the, when the gut's low oxygen potential, it promotes the growth of the bacteria. The bacteria produce a chemical. The chemical uh, matures the uh, colonocytes. The colonocytes consume the oxygen, which keeps the low oxygen potential. It's a loop. It's a, it's a positive feedback loop, which supports the stability of that ecosystem. If we give you an antibiotic, and we wipe out a lot of those uh, um, uh, anaerobic bacteria that are producing some of those um, uh, short-chain fatty acids, and we promote the growth of things like proteobacteria, which are, um, often have more antibiotic resistance genes and are more resilient to higher concentrations in oxygen, um, we see a significant reduction in the production of short-chain fatty acids, a significant reduction in the maturity of colonocytes lining the gut, and a significant increase in the amount of oxygen leaving the bloodstream and entering into the lumen. So you get a negative feedback loop. The system is broken, and it's very hard to get it back into status. Best, way to, best thing to do after you take an antibiotic is to eat as healthy as you possibly can. Consume a lot of fiber, 30 grams a day, and just try and eat healthily. That will allow the um, health-promoting bacteria to regenerate and provide them with an ecosystem which promotes their growth. Um, I see absolutely zero evidence supporting the use of a probiotic post-antibiotic treatment. Uh, probiotics can be valuable. There's lots of clinical trial data suggesting they can be helpful in treating certain diseases, but there's absolutely no evidence that it can be beneficial post an antibiotic therapy. Contrary to that, many clinicians will tell you that the best thing you can do after an antibiotic is to take a probiotic. Um, and you ask them, ask them one time, is there any evidence to support that claim? It's just, just, uh, just challenge them. Because I was told by this itinerant Englishman who was on stage that there wasn't. Uh, uh, but you, know, uh, you can, can uh, refer them to me, and I'll give them a dressing down. Cartoon time. Um, what we used to do in the world was play outside and work outside. We were exposed to lots of different antigens, lots of different microbial exposure. We now live and work inside, and we sterilize those environments as much as possible, which actually kills off all of the microbes, good and bad ones, significantly reducing the diversity of life that we're exposed to. That antigenic reduction in antigenic diversity actually leads to the emergence of allergic disease. We actually think that by augmenting our exposure to beneficial non-pathogenic organisms, we may actually be able to protect people from the development of allergic disease. And I, I use this you know, cartoon format because, um, and I've, I've given this cartoon format to the heads of the NIH, for example, because, uh, because irrespective of the potential uh, for people to understand things, everybody loves a cartoon. Um, to, to prove this hypothesis, we did um, uh, work with um, uh, a, a collaboration across the University of Chicago in northern Arizona, um, where we explored uh, this phenomenon in two very well-controlled populations, the Amish and the Hutterites. The Amish and the Hutterites both live in, um, in well, uh, the Midwest uh, from, I guess, uh, Pennsylvania is not Midwest, but getting close. Pennsylvania all the way through to Ohio, that's really the, um, and uh, Indiana, that's the Amish. The Hutterites really live up in the Dakotas. Both of them are genetically related, um, although they are moderately inbred. But the uh, genetic relatedness um, uh, is very prevalent in their uh, susceptibility to asthma. So both populations have exactly the same allelic genetic sensitivity to the development of early onset wheeze and the development of asthma in childhood. Um, they both live very similar lives as well. They, they, they both reject uh, technology. Right, you can take your children to one of these farms to show them that a child can survive without an iPad for more than 10 minutes, and the children should work. Um, I've taken my children to this farm, and the kids were actively working on the farm before school and after school, um, and my children looked at them like there was alien life forms. Um, but you know, this is a working environment. Even you don't have pets. The dogs and cats work on the farm. It's a, it's a very utilitarian existence. Um, the big difference between these two populations is in how they interact with the farm. So the Amish live on the farm. The front door is 50 feet from the barn door. And the children are working on the farm before and after school. In the Hutterite community, it's not like that. So the, there's, a, there's a commune where all the houses are. And then at a distance from the commune is an area with all of the uh, farming area. And only boys over the age of 14 are allowed on the farm. So children, irrespective of gender, do not get exposure to the farming environment. Apart from that, they eat the 
the best, most wholesome organic foods from the local farming environment. And there's no GMOs, there's no pesticides. They're, they're eating a whole foods diet. I mean, it's phenomenal, right? But the Amish only have about 3% asthma in their population, up to 4% in some communes. Uh, the average for the US is about 8 to 10%. The Hutterites have 25 to 30% asthma in their population, an asthma-susceptible population that is being overstimulated to produce a significant increase in asthma epidemiology in that population. What's driving that? If we look at their immune systems, um, you can start to see the differentiation. So in, in this context, um, on the top left, I have neutrophils. Uh, for those of you who are not immunologists, neutrophils are uh, like little sentinel cells that run around inside the body looking for foreign objects. When they see a foreign object, uh, they send out signals for more white blood cells to come in and consume those uh, foreign objects. In the process, killing themselves. Um, the Amish have a lot of neutrophils, and the Hutterites have lower, significantly lower number of neutrophils. They have, uh, the Hutterites have a lot of eosinophils here in red. Eosinophils are um, in this context, pro-inflammatory cells, which are um, exacerbated by the process of inflammation and, and asthma. The most interesting thing here is, if you're into this kind of thing, and I am, um, is CXCR4 and CD11 B and C, cell surface markers on the outside of the neutrophils. These circulating peripheral bub mononucleosides have these cell surface markers, which make them um, a little bit sticky, right? they're more likely to adhere to each other. And when they adhere to each other, they can form rafts in circulation, which can actually, when they finally see an antigen from the outside world, can activate a significant increase in cytokine response, causing significant inflammation. Um, so the paradigm is this, right? The, the Hutterites aren't being exposed to many antigens. They're living a relatively clean lifestyle, um, not, not living on a farm like their ancestors did, um, and they uh, have that interruption. So they don't need many neutrophils because they're not killing them off, sensing this antigenic storm in the outside environment. So they don't need them. So they don't produce very many. But the ones that they have live for a lot longer because they're not being used. And uh, an old neutrophil is two to three days old, right? But over that period, they start to express these cell surface markers. And those old neutrophils can now cause substantially greater degrees of inflammation, triggering um, eosinophilia, um, and in this process, um, an asthmatic attack. OK, that's great. We have an, uh, um, uh, uh, a, a relationship now between the immunology of the children and their lifestyle. Does that mean anything? We can go one step further. We can take mice that we've um, triggered to be uh, allergic to a particular compound, in this case, a valvamin. And we take those mice, and we expose them to what the children are being exposed to. In this case, we sneak into children's bedrooms in Amish and Hutterite communities and suck up dust like some kind of evil, uh, you know, what's the green guy, Grinch, you know, from Dr. Zeus. We referenced Dr. Zeus twice tonight. Um, and in this case, we take that dust, we form an installation, we install it into the nasal passages of these mice so they get the same kind of exposure that a child does, sleeping in a bedroom, deep breathing the antigenic exposure of that room. If we, if we um, expose a mouse that's allergic to a valvamin, reference here is over in yellow, you see a significant increase in the bowel cells of eosinophils, um, which uh, suggests uh, elevated inflammation. If we expose the mouse um, to the Amish dust and then expose them to a valvamin, we get a significant abrogation of the inflammatory response. Not so with the Hutterites here in red. The Hutterite dust is not protective against eosinophilia. The take home there is, um, the Amish should really be selling their dust on the street because uh, you'd make a lot of money from uh, feeding it to children. Um, the difficulty with that paradigm is we still don't know if this is causative. All we know is that we can transfer the phenotype of the allergic response to a mouse, right? Um, we also don't know what the dose dependency of this is. If, if I say that a child should grow up on a farm and children that do grow up on farms have a 50% reduction in the likelihood of developing asthma. But if I say you should grow up on a farm, Great. Um, what if you live in a city? How often should you be exposed to a farm? Can you take your baby's face and rub them into the side of a cow, and that's it? Right? Is that enough? Um, when we deal with the FDA and we're dealing with drug regulation, we have to deal with dose-dependent responses. We have to be. Uh, we have to look for efficacy. We have to look for an endpoint, and we have to deal with dose dependency. What is the dose-dependent response of being exposed to a farm? We do not know. There's no way of actually figuring that out. 
because we cannot do controlled experiments with yard populations where we expose them to farms and don't. We have to just rely on the fact that some people live on a farm and some people don't. Control populations, and how do you do a placebo farm? You know, <laughs> Those kind of things are very difficult to manipulate, and trust me, I've tried to propose it. I actually proposed to the NIH, it wasn't funded, that, uh, I'm still bitter, that uh, uh, we could take a mobile farm around the Hutterite community and expose certain children in a randomized pattern to cows over a period of time. Um, it was not funded. What's interesting from this, we take this one step further, we look at the bacterial population that the mouse are exposed to, that's shaping the immune system. The immune system in the body is now responding. What happens when you alter the immune system? You also alter the microbiome. And in this context, the immune system of these children is shaping what types of bacteria can live in their intestine. These children are both eating the same thing, they both live the same kind of lifestyle except for that farmyard exposure. It's a wonderfully controlled environment. So what we did here is we took the uh, germ-free mice, these are mice without bacteria in them, and we gave them yellow soup. We gave them a fecal microbiome transplant, right, from children that had either asthma growing up in an Amish community or no asthma, or asthma growing up in a Hutterite community or no asthma. In both situations, the asthmatic stool elevated um, the degree of bowel eosinophilia to a pro-inflammatory status. Basically, asthmatic stool did not protect a mouse from developing eosinophilia, this pro-inflammatory-like phenotype. Whereas Amish stool from children who did not have asthma was protective. So not only is Amish dust protective, you now can now go around mining Amish children's poop and uh, make a mint. Uh, um, I really strongly suggest you don't even try that. But um, the paradigm with that is that the, what happens to you outside your body shapes what's going on inside your body, which can shape how your body responds to the outside. Again, everything's a cycle, a circle of life. And we can actually track that down and drive it into small molecules. So these are chemicals in, oh, I'll do it again. These are chemicals in the bloodstream, I'm gonna keep on doing it, in the bloodstream of the, of, um, the mice that have been exposed uh, to either Amish poop in blue or um, Hutterite poop in red. And in green, these are germ-free animals that have never seen a bacteria in their life. And the two chemicals at the top, 3-phenylpropanoic acid and indole-3-acetic acid, are super elevated in mice that have got um, uh, asthma-free Amish stool. Uh, the uh, indole-3-acetic acid, for example, pardon me, is produced by bacteria and has a receptor on immune cells in the lung um, called AHR1, which mediates um, um, inflammatory responses such as dendritic cell activation, type 2 cytokine response, and, and can also activate IL-22. So in this context, if, you, if, you if uh, AHR1 receives um, uh, indole-3-acetic acid, it can downregulate inflammation and promote um, uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-22, which can increase barrier function and promote um, uh, lung health. This is now what we're referring to as the gut-lung axis, um, the ability of the gut microbiome to actually influence distal processes in cell lines outside of the gut. And that, that becomes fundamentally important uh, when we consider something later, which I'll talk about. Um, I talked about stratification of populations. Just very quickly, a lot of detail on the slide. I'm, I'm just going to make a, a point. We can now use the microbiome in the nasal passage of adult asthma sufferers. Um, in this case, the mycobiome. This is the fungal communities that are present in the uh, respiratory passage of um, adult asthma sufferers. And in this study, we were able to accurately, with machine learning, um, disassociate asthmatic subjects into the type of inflammatory status that they have. Why is this important? Because if you can disassociate or, or refine your population into different types of um, allergic response, you can provide them with personalized or individualized therapies that are um, precise for their particular condition. The alternative is you try them on one thing. If nothing happens, you move them on to the next therapy. If nothing happens, you move them on to another therapy. Trial and error. In this situation, um, uh, we trialed at University of Chicago we're now able to stratify our patient population to such a degree of accuracy that we can actually, when they come into the clinic, um, provide them with a more accurate, um, immediate first-line therapy. That can be a fundamental impact upon health. Um, this is an elevated plus maze. It's about a meter off the ground. Um, two sides of it are a, a closed box, and two sides of it are open to the world. We use this to test anxiety in mice and rats. If I take a, a, a normal 
mouse or a rat, and I place it on this platform, it will spend the vast majority of its time in these um, enclosed spaces on either side of this platform, right? Because it's hiding. If I take a germ-free rat or mouse, it will spend the vast majority of its time on the open platform, exploring the world and looking around. I'm not saying the rat or mouse is more anxious, that would be anthropomorphizing a mouse, which would be inappropriate, but it does tend to display a significant reduction in its fear of being eaten by prey. And you would have assumed that was an evolutionary process. You would have assumed, right, quite rightly one would assume, that um, mummy mouse hid and passed her genes onto baby mouse and baby mouse hid and passed her genes onto the next mouse population and that was a selective advantage against predator escape. But in this case, if I take that germ-free mouse, a mouse that's never seen a bacteria, and I add bacteria back into it, it will go and hide again. The biological behavioral phenotype of this rodent is being influenced by the presence or absence of microbes, which is interesting. Not causative, but interesting. Um, so to explore that, we, we know that microbes can be linked to many different aspects of behavior, such as brain development in utero, and I, we've done a lot of work in that space, and I've, um, I have an autistic son, so I have a personal interest in that relationship. Um, but we do a lot of work in mood and behavior, and we've come up with several things I'll talk about in a minute, and neurodegenerative disorders, so dealing with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, huge amount of research in that area as well. And all of them have identified a milieu of interaction between the microbiome and the disease phenotype. Genetics plays a key role, sets up the stage, but the interaction between the microbiome and host cellular processes can be, often be a progenitor. And the key facet of a causative relationship here is, um, if I look at major depressive disorder, so clinically depressed versus non-depressed individuals, if I do a, a yellow soup or a fecal microbiome transplant from a clinically depressed population into an animal population, I can transfer that phenotype. I can make depressed mice or rats. Or behaviorally altered animals. You can't really say they're depressed, right? I didn't give them a questionnaire. Um, and non-depressed individuals put that into an animal and you see um, a significant reduction in behavioral phenotypes associated with anxiety or depression. And then you can transfer the microbiota from a quote unquote non-depressed animal into a depressed animal and alleviate um, the symptoms of anxiety and depression in that animal, right? Um, again, huge amount of anthropomorphizing there. Uh, that is literally me trying to make it understandable. But the paradigm of behavioral transfer as a phenotype between these animals is mediated for the vast majority of our study design through the transfer of the microbes. Um, and interestingly, there's a huge amount of comorbidity between uh, GI disorders, gut disorders, and central nervous system disorders. Um, if you, uh, um, a lot of people that suffer from depression, anxiety often have poor bowel movements. Children with autism often are constipated. Uh, uh, people who get uh, diarrhea are often depressed. And you'd, you'd say, well, yeah, if you have diarrhea, you're gonna be depressed, right? But there's a relationship there. It can actually affect mood disorder, which is outside of the pure discomfort. And, and we are just starting to appreciate that. Um, in this study, we, we took brain scans, um, uh, MRIs, of people um, who uh, were depressed in major depressive disorder clinic or not depressed. And we looked at the connectivity, the neuroconnectivity between their prefrontal lobes. Um, in, if you have, um, uh, here we are, if you have a significant increase in prefrontal cortex connectivity, right, you um, are significantly less likely to be depressed. But if you have a disruption in the connectivity between the prefrontal cortex, uh, you are significantly more likely to be depressed. And that is highly associated with the abundance of a particular genus of bacteria called Bacteroides. These bacteria actually produce a neurotransmitter as a byproduct of their uh, metabolic activity called GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, which is the major neuroinhibitor in our central nervous system and brain. And what we started to see is if we take this organism and we gavage it, we uh, inject it into the intestine of a depressed animal, we can alleviate the symptomology that we would associate with depression. We can alter its behavioral mood by adding these bacteria in. And when we take these bacteria away, uh, the mood can come back, it's suggesting a causative relationship between that. This suggests that potentially we could come up with a probiotic, potentially in the future, potentially, a probiotic which could be used to alleviate depressive disorders and maybe anxiety. Why is that important? We have loads of antidepressants. Well, antidepressants have a bad rap. 
and many people don't take them, especially in, um, in uh, underrepresented minority communities who, um, uh, for whatever reason, are, um, are alienated to a, the use of it because of the stigma associated with being depressed or having a depressive disorder. So people don't take them. And people who are pregnant, uh, that being women, I've never met a pregnant man yet, but women that are pregnant are less likely to take an antidepressant even if they're diagnosed with it. And uh, perinatal depression, depression occurring during pregnancy or postpartum, is a significant problem in our society and needs to be tackled. If there was a way of regulating this environment in a more, dare I say it, holistic fashion, it might actually uh, have greater penetration into the communities that require the greatest mental health care in our society. And that could have huge implications for society. So we're really interested in driving forward that paradigm, providing other opportunities, other therapeutic avenues, which aren't normally available. Surgical complications. I'm whipping through the greatest hits here. Um, in this context, I, I was a surgeon for seven years, although they wouldn't let me use a knife. I'm not sure why. Um, but in, what we did was uh, I was called into a, a surgeon's office one day uh, to uh, query a problem. Um, he kept on getting this infection, despite the fact uh, that whenever uh, they did the surgical procedure, um, the wound was covered in antibiotics, the patient had intravenous antibiotics, oral antibiotics, had their gut washed out, but every time they did this, something went wrong. Um, so I said, well, um, was there any correlation to their lifestyle? That's always the first question with a microbiome scientist. What do they eat, right? Have they taken antibiotics recently? And it turns out that a diet, um, especially a high-fat, high-sugar diet, uh, like I'll refer to this as the American diet, I like the British diet, which is super healthy, um, has a big impact on the type of bacteria which can grow in the gut. And if you then put that microbiome through oral antibiotics, IV antibiotics, and fluids, and then you cut into the gut environment, you are hoping that those bugs that have grown up because of your poor diet aren't there when you finally have to undergo healing. And in this context, recovery would ideally look like an increase in the microbial functionality of your gut, and everything goes back to uh, uh, everything goes in a good way. It just doesn't work like that. So, and if you think about it, it makes sense. So let's say I um, uh, resect a piece of colon. I do a couple of things. I've already talked about the good bacteria disliking oxygen. Well, cutting into the gut enters a lot of oxygen into the gastrointestinal tract. That deactivates or kills off a lot of organisms. I put in antibiotics or an IV, which has a significant impact upon reducing the diversity. And what you have left over are the hardcore Mad Max survivors, which are able to survive that onslaught. And then the body does one last thing. I've stitched up the gut, form an anastomotic junction. The body starts to suck out phosphorus, and the bacteria starving activate a new uh, phenotype and start to grow um, a biofilm, a motility formation, and promote the production of an enzyme called collagenase. Collagenase, as the name suggests, breaks down collagen. Collagen is the major constituent that holds your cells together. You get an opening up in your gastrointestinal tract. Your gut contents spill out into your body cavity, and you get sepsis. And um, in about 3% of cases, this can lead to death. Um, that's unavoidable, it's theoretically, right? Turns out it's not. We used to think it's because the surgeons were making mistakes. They didn't staple the anastomosis properly, or they didn't use the right stitches, or they were sloppy, or they were overtired. Um, and yet, despite zero evidence of virtually any of those instances, the malpractice suits kept on coming through, right? It turns out that in every case that we looked at in University of Chicago, over 167 cases with John Alverdi, this relationship um, uh, was uh, more the, the prevalent case. They had collagenolytic bacteria in their gut at the time of going into surgery, and those collagenolytic bacteria were more likely to cause a surgical site infection. Um, and we can see that in all of our preclinical models. Um, interestingly, in a study we just published, if you put an animal um, on a high-fat diet, you see the expression of collagenolytic bacteria in the intestine, and you put them through surgery, you'll get surgical site infection, you'll get sepsis. If you put that same animal on a high-fat diet on a high-fiber diet for a period of uh, just three days, four days prior to surgery, you completely eradicate the risk of surgical site infection. I mean, 100%. Um, and admittedly, our numbers are still only 16, 20, 25 animals, but it's still a phenomenal finding. Translating that into a clinical trial could have massive significance for our ability to push uh, forward and back the frontiers.
And we are exploring that, uh, John Alberti and I, um, in a, um, a, a multi-center trial. Obesity. Um, I, I did say I could predict if you were obese or not based on your microbiome. Again, uh, maybe that's not necessary. You can just look at you. But um, in the context of this, a colleague of mine who was morbidly obese, I won't say who he was, even though his name was on the slide, which is a little bit of an oversight. Don't tell the IRB. But in this context, um, he was morbidly obese, and he lost a huge amount of weight, 113 pounds, almost a third of his body weight, by going on a, um, a whole grain diet. He ate whole grains and stayed off virtually everything else for um, a period of 12 months. Um, and uh, lost all that weight and checked his microbiome at the beginning, middle, end, and throughout the trajectory. And there was one bug that was very abundant at the beginning. Almost 3% of his microbial ecosystem was this one species, which had disappeared or dropped below the level of detection by the end of the study. It was uh, Enterobacter cloaceae B29. When you take that bug and you put it into an animal, it can significantly alter its phenotype. I don't know if you can see the difference. Um, uh, this one's nicer and this one's meaner. But, um, uh, and, and, and in fact, this, this picture is actually from a fecal microbiome transplant one, but the, the, the phenomenon is the same. It's just the, the other one has the animal splayed open in our paper, and it looks very ugly, so we don't like to show it. Um, but the, exact, the animals look exactly the same. This one organism, irrespective of uh, whether the animal is germ-free and has this organism introduced, or whether it has a microbiome and we introduce it, if we feed the animal a high-fat diet, it will put on a huge amount of weight if that organism is present fundamentally changing the paradigm of the health of the animal. And, and work we did with um, Vanessa Leone and, uh, and uh, Eugene Chang at University of Chicago we tried to unpick that lock, the elucidate the mechanism behind it. Um, if, you are, um, uh, uh, if you are jet lagged, if you're working nights, if your circadian rhythm is disrupted, you will put on more weight for the same calorific intake. That's a well understood phenomenon, right? Um, and we can actually translate that phenomenon into animals. We see the same phenomenon if we feed an animal a high-fat diet. If we feed a mouse a high-fat diet, we see a complete disruption in the circadian rhythm of their bacteria. And interestingly, all of their clock genes, the genes in their organs and cells which regulate their perception of time, are disrupted. In, not in the brain, in the body. So it, when you're jet lagged, your brain is perceiving time differently to your body, which is the reason you need to poop and you get hungry at different times of the day when you shouldn't be, right? If you eat a high-fat diet, the bacteria in your gut that are promoted by that high-fat diet produce chemicals which alter the circadian clock genes in your liver, for example, and affect your ability to process food energy, significantly increasing food energy storage over food energy uh, expenditure, um, uh, altering mitochondrial activity in the muscle tissue, but I don't have time to go into that. We, we uh, demonstrated this by knocking out clock genes in the liver and feeding animals high-fat diets, and we couldn't make the animals fat. <laughs> Which, uh, it, I don't suggest that. There was uh, somebody working on RNA splicing. Maybe you can knock out clock genes and make everyone thin, but you know, we want to go down that route. Um, on the last track, a bit of fun, each one of you right now is living in a little microbial soup. Uh, so every single person in this room, irrespective of your clothing, is emitting around 30 to 40 million bacterial cells into your immediate vicinity every hour. They're coming out of your breath. Everybody in the front row is getting a little bit of my oral bacteria. I know, I know. I understand. It was bad. But um, that's a, it's a fundamental relationship. Every single person sitting next to each other, you're stimulating each other's immune systems. You're having an impact upon each other, even if you're not physically interacting. Um, and this paradigm is interesting. Um, how many people will try and draw down their sleeve when they go into the restroom in order not to touch something, right? If you think this sleeve or any material you're wearing can stop bacteria and viruses from passing through it, you really don't understand size fractions, right? This is like a loose fishnet stocking to a microbe. Um, things will pass through it very easily. Uh, there's no point in putting toilet paper on a toilet seat. It does absolutely nothing to stop your transmission rates. But we got into this because we wanted to understand how to make buildings healthier, how to stop the development of diseases and autoimmune conditions that were associated with buildings. And we work with uh, homes and hospitals and office architects to explore this phenomenon. The major paradigm is you're constantly interacting with the microbial world around you. So you're inhaling things and you're breathing them out. That's a constant microbial exchange that your immune system is sensing, just like those Amish and Hutterite children. Their immune system is sensing the things they're breathing in. And you're exchanging them for touch. So if I touch this surface, I leave an oily residue behind um, that some bacteria are also transferred and they can survive in that oily residue for a period of time. That's fomite transmission, but also I can pick things up from the environment. That's disease fomite transmission. 
Um, and also, the bacteria and fungi in the room um, can produce chemicals, volatile organic compounds. Um, there's an old adage that in very old buildings, such as this one, if you go into a locked room that hasn't been opened and there's a little bit of moisture in there, you can get fungi growing, which produce volatile organic compounds which have neurodevelopment, neuroactive properties and can uh, affect the insulation of um, hallucinogenic activity, right? In this context, you could feel a chill up your spine and hear voices and see things. Uh, ghosts are produced by funguses. I love that idea, right? Fungi are, are ghost productions. Probably Complete nonsense, but it, I, I love the idea. Um, but it's true that you know they are producing a rapid content, aldehydes, ketones, alcohols, we're seeing geosamines, we're seeing amines. Um, there's a rich chemistry to that environment as well, and it's all having an impact. We also know that the environment, so this is a very complicated slide, but this is basically code on usage bias uh, by the synonymous versus non synonymous mutation ratio inside genes associated with antibiotic resistance in bacteria in a hospital. The hospital environment itself, when the bacteria leave our body, is highly selective for things which can survive. And the things which can survive are often the most adaptable ones, and those are the ones with virulence genes and things which allow them to be adapted to the environment. And this slide basically demonstrates there is a significant selective pressure for microbial antibiotic resistance. In, in the absence of antibiotics, just from landing, on a cold, dry surface after having been in a highly competitive, um, uh, moist, wet environment, right? You are changing the ecosystem dynamic and it selects for certain strains in a population which have a greater degree of virulence and pathogenicity. Um, and this is part of our plan to eradicate antibiotic resistance. So, um, yeah, they, you know, we want to be better stewards of antibiotic resistance, but we also think there's an opportunity to manipulate the environment of buildings so that when bacteria leave our body, they aren't able to express that phenotype of virulence and pathogenicity. And in this case, we're actually adding bacteria back into hospital buildings. We're using bacillus subtilis spores that are sporulated, but which with a small amount of moisture can activate. Those bacteria at high enough abundances are non-pathogenic as far as we're aware. Um, well, the uh, US Army used to spray them on cities and towns to track, um, as a, a modified variable, to track the potential for um, uh, bioterrorism threats in the 1950s. So all of you over a certain age will have been exposed to Bacillus subtilis in high doses, and most of you seem okay. But in this context, um, we've shown that you can add this um, as a cleaning agent onto surfaces in lieu of a secondary cleaner, and it increases the competitive ecology of that surface. So when this bug leaves your body from a highly competitive environment in your body, lands on this environment, it's the last thing surviving, it faces still a huge amount of competition on a tabletop or a floor. And that competition uh, makes expressing virulence or antibiotic resistance incredibly expensive. They, they literally cannot energetically afford to do it. So they don't. And when they don't, they start to die out. And we actually see a massive reduction, almost 85% reduction in the abundance, the quantifiable abundance of these pathogens in hospital environments where we've used these surface cleaners. So we're really excited about that potential. And we started this by exploring different hospital environments. This is the Center for Care and Discovery in Chicago. 365 days of consecutive, model, um, consecutive observation in this building. We started two months before it became an operational hospital, continued after for 10 months after people left the, uh, entered into the building, the patients and the doctors. And we monitored hundreds of different surfaces, over 15,000 samples, including air and water, the patient themselves, their room, hospital staff, and nurse stations. Um, the, big, the big reveal, which was not very exciting, I guess, was that when the hospital became operational, and uh, in here, oh, sorry, um, in here we have um, uh, post-opening is in red, pre-opening is in blue. So when it moved from uh, pre-opening to post-opening, the environment became flooded with human bacteria, bacteria from your bodies, um, and it fundamentally changed the microbial ecology of the building surfaces, um, in significantly increasing things like uh, Karenibacterial abundance and Staphylococcus abundance that are very common skin-associated bacteria. Um, and interestingly, this is uh, over 365 days of monitoring, um, and this is the degree of similarity. So this is the summer in Chicago, and it's very moist. And when you have a lot of humidity in the air, you significantly increase the degree of microbial sharing between people in that space, uh, because the bacteria can survive longer outside of your body. So you actually have a greater chance of acquiring each other's microbiota from an environmental interaction. 
And we can actually track the movement. We use um, Bayesian artificial neural network model development that we created for looking in oceans. We now apply it to human uh, gut and building systems. This is a patient over here on the right. And over here on the left is um, uh, an archetypal staff member. And the edges are the movement of different types of bacteria, Acinetobacter, Karenibacteria, Staphylococcus, things like that. The key takeaway here is the staff hand here is pretty much the only source of bacteria to the axilla, that's the armpit of the patient, or to the patient's hand. Um, um, it rarely ever goes the other way. So the patient is acquiring bacteria from the staff, but not the other direction. Why? It's not because there's some weird stuff going on with the patient. It's because when you observe people in a hospital and you have postdocs and graduate students watching what the nursing staff are doing every time, they wash their hands all the time. And that significantly disrupts the, their ability to acquire microbes from people, right? Wash your hands. If you don't want to get bugs from people too much, wash your hands. It's real simple. So they're, they're moving between patient rooms and washing their hands each time and significantly disrupt, disrupting their colonization potential from the patient. We did this in homes. Um, so here I have a young family. It's actually mine. Don't tell the IRB. Um, these are noses, feet, and hands. Um, floors down here, and these are surfaces that hands interact with. And you can map the movement of microbial dynamics because we're looking at things over time. That's interesting. What's more interesting is when you add dogs into the equation. Uh, dogs significantly increase the dynamic exchange of microbes in an environment. And anyone that owns dogs knows why, right? Couples with a dog share more bacteria between you and your, your couple, right, than couples without dogs. Dogs are like superhighways. In fact, couples with a baby share less bacteria than couples with a dog. And anyone who has babies and not dogs will understand what I'm going on about. But um, my wife, if you think about that, that means uh, if you want to save your marriage, you will probably get a dog because more microbial similarity is going to be better than a baby. My wife took that to heart. Made me rescue Captain Bo Diggley. I did not name him, but he is from Kentucky, um, and uh, he's a good boy. Um, and... Um, we can actually physically interact and map how people are interacting in a space. This is a young couple living with a lodger. Um, every single dot in here is a microbial sample. The closer they are together, the more similar they are. So down here, I have um, the red and blue samples are the young couple, and they're very microbiologically similar. The uh, lodger is very different to them. So you can actually see that even if you're physically interacting with somebody in a space, you're going to be sharing more microbes than you are with somebody who's just inhabiting that space, right? But it also means potentially you could track infidelity. So if one of those people had been interacting with the lodger, we would have been able to tell. Um, but you can also tell um, the social fabric of a home. So this is what we did for the National Institute of Justice. The x-axis here is time um, here. The y-axis is the percentage of bacteria um, found on that surface that originated from one of six occupants. So person one in red is a young man. He's 25 years old. He lives with his mother and his father. His orange is his dad, person two. And uh, yellow is his mum, person three. And there's three dogs. Look at the kitchen counter. The, in many instances, uh, this is a horribly gender imbalanced tone. This is where uh, you could say it's social fabric. 100% of the bacteria on the kitchen counter originate from the mother um, in uh, nearly the entire framework of that observational period until she goes away for a few days and the father's microbiome explodes onto the kitchen counter as he desperately fends for himself making toast. Um, I, 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 uh, of all the illustrative examples I've come up with in my career, this is the one I love the most. Um, uh, the bedroom floors and kitchen floors are covered with dog bacteria over time. There's a weird anomaly from the young man on the bedroom floor, which we don't talk about. Um, the doorknobs and light switches are covered in dog bacteria, not because you have dexterous dogs, but because you act as a fomite transfer between the dog and that surface. You are moving a flood of microbes around all the time. As long as you're properly vaccinated, as long as you take common sense precautions to prevent food infection, you're extremely unlikely to get any kind of infection. And even if you are, unless it's viruses, God, viruses are off this kilt, especially uh, with uh, our current situation. But um, just wash your hands, and you will significantly decrease the threat of that as well. Um, we actually took this one stage further at University of Chicago, and we published this, but after a, a long protest by the president. Um, this is a college dorm uh, at University of Chicago. We could accurately map the interaction space of every single student in that dorm, um, telling which room they'd been in at which particular time and who was physically interacting with whom. Um, we didn't obviously say that in the paper, but it's incredibly informative. Um, the difficulty with that is also it's, it's highly immoral, um, and therefore uh, we, we can't talk about it. Um, you can have your microbiome sequenced. Uh, we won't tell you anything about your health. 
uh, because there's no clinical data to really support that in this context. But if you donate to the American Gut Project, um, you are supporting citizen science. Um, so $99 and have your microbiome sequence. And that goes into our massive publicly accessible open access database uh, where clinicians around the world can compare their clinical data to this massive population of people and see if the traits they observe in their microbiome populations are related to things going on around the world. Um, and to accelerate that, we designed a smart toilet. This is what we're talking about with BiomeSense, um, which uh, looks much better when you shine a light underneath it. Um, but uh, basically, it will automatically, oh, sorry, automatically collect a sample every single day um, by uh, switching out. And I was making a joke before, like George III had his stool looked at every single day, tasted and smelt by some very dedicated humans, um, only the English. Um, and uh, and uh, so you can tell a lot by your stool. Well, we're, we're taking that one stage further and democratizing it, so you don't have to be a king. Um, and uh, when you're sitting on your throne and doing your data dump in the morning, to paraphrase something, um, we can collect that data and now use it to understand uh, the dynamic tra trajectory of a particular person. Applying this to clinical trials is huge, because right now it's incredibly difficult to get samples every day from anybody. You usually get one or two. People don't like physically interacting with their stool. It's very difficult to do it. So we wanted to get around it by building a, uh, a mechanical way of getting around it. Um, so imagine after you've done your morning business, uh, we'll call it that, um, uh, you are looking in a mirror and your microbiome profile and chemical profile pops up on the screen and we can compare you to other people, the average person, similar diet, similar gender, see how you're doing, place you on a microbial map, see how similar you are to thousands of other people and see if there's any clinical data that can associate your current microbiome status based on your prior history um, to other people and disease states, potentially even predicting things, future scoping, um, such as depression. And um, in, a, in a very early stage clinical investigation, it looks like it, that it might be possible. And then maybe you can take that one stage further and recommend something to do. I'm I'm being hand wavy and almost tongue in cheek by suggesting lactobacillus, which is a commonly available probiotic. But if I said something else, other people would try it. And as far as I'm concerned, lactobacillus is pretty benign. So if you really want to try it, go for it. It won't do anything apart from harm your pocketbook. So this is a paradigm of the future, right? A, a, a way of continually monitoring things in order to have a significant impact upon health in that context. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. There's a procedure for uh, questions. We have some mic runners. They have different colored mics. We have a black mic. Uh, what other color do we have out there? I only see black. Red, blue. OK, we're going to go in the black, red, blue order. So we'll start with Tim Thomas. Yeah. Tim Thomas, a member of the organization. I'm asking what your opinion is about the um, hand sterilizer devices that are placed ubiquitously around the city. Um, the, the problem with hand sterilizers, um, let's say we deal with the alcohol ones, right? Um, for the most part, things that have antibacterial agents like triclosan have been eradicated from most uh, hand sanitizers. Unfortunately, it, it, triclosan as an antibacterial is still ever present in a lot of different products, such as toothpastes. Uh, it should, probably shouldn't be, but it is. Um, we've shown triclosan can have impacts upon children's hormonal uh, productivity. So there's areas there. But there are alcoholic hand sanitizers around. I got no problem with you using them, but people don't use them properly. You know Lysol, like the the, uh, the cleaning surface cleaning solution. If you ever read the back of the Lysol thing, and I, I've worked a lot with Procter and Gamble on, on their messaging, um, you actually have to take many different Lysol wipes, squeeze them out onto a surface, make sure the surface is moist, and leave it moist for four to five minutes. You tell me one person in this room that actively does that with the Lysol wipe. No, nope, you wipe it, done. It's dry, good. It doesn't do anything. And the problem with people using those uh, hand sanitizers is they take a small amount, they rub it over the hands, done. It's not effective. You actually need to leave it in contact for a prolonged period of time, especially if you're dealing with viruses. And for the most part, uh, bacteria are not your threat in our modern society. In, in societies with endemic bacterial pathogens, different story, right? You've got to be a lot more careful. In uh, Washington, D.C., you're likely to getting a bacterial infection off of a seat or in a toilet stool minuscule, right? Um, uh, but getting a virus infection, especially in flu season, that's incredibly likely. So, uh, so using those, you've got to learn how to use them. Hot soap and water is just, if not more, effective. 
It's just obviously more difficult to find those kind of dispensaries. Great microphone. Yes. Please stand. Please stand. Tell us your name and if you're a member. Uh, Orit Zohar. This is my first time coming to your meeting, and this was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, you have to hold the microphone close to your mouth, too. Okay. Uh, my There's so many rules. There's so many rules. Yeah. It's my question, dreadful. My question has to do with mold. There is such a high percentage of buildings with mold. Yeah. And I understand genetically only people that are have, I guess, uh, the particular gene are reactive. Uh, but given, given your talk, and I know you went through a, uh, quickly a mold, a fungus presentation that I, I missed, <laughs> couldn't follow. Um, is there some way to deal with a building, someone who's sensitive with, with this uh, microbiome? I mean, um, um, if you go back to the Bible, in Leviticus, it stipulates that if, if there is a respiratory problem, I'm paraphrasing, um, then you should wash the uh, walls with uh, horse's blood. The fresh horse's blood, not <laughs> the old dry kind. Um, and that will eradicate the infection with inside your dwelling. Um, I wouldn't recommend that unless you know someone with a lot of fresh horse's blood. It probably wouldn't do anything. Um, joking aside, uh, if the only way to stop mold growing is to eradicate the moisture source. And then once you've done that, get rid of whatever it is that was covered in the mold. Because once the mold Pardon me. <coughs> Once the mold dries out, you've got a lot of spores, and that will cause inflammatory response. Genetic predisposition or none, it's, it's a major problem. And it's remarkable, if you talk to architects, this is the one thing they find difficult. Architects will design a building as best they can and with the primary indicator to keep the building as dry as possible on the inside, right? Unfortunately, when you build buildings, things don't always go to the architectural plans, and you end up with, even today, after building how many millions of buildings around the world, we still have a problem where we don't appear to be able to keep buildings dry. Um, natural disasters like Katrina aside, where the fungal uh, mold growth was horrendous and caused enormous irreparable damage to the local occupants' health, um, there is a persistent problem with that, especially in underserviced dwellings. Um, and you know, uh, we can all look to the, uh, the, the, uh, the landlords that aren't doing their job in uh, maintaining building infrastructure. But in the greater scheme of things, it's going to be a continuous problem. I don't see it going away. Um, the best thing you can do is, unfortunately, move out. Right? There literally isn't another immediate solution that comes to mind. It's not like you can eradicate it. It's a great we, major problem in our society. I think we have the blue mic now. Hi, yes. Hello. My name is David Lewis. Uh, I'm a member. Thank you so much for the talk. Thank you. Um, I do have a question. Um, sort of looking towards the future, uh, do you think we'll get to a point where you can, that we can exploit the, uh, the microbiome uh, such that we can either, um, I'll say, help fight or eradicate viral infections, you know, especially with the, the thoughts that we have, you know, the coronavirus going on right now? And if so, what do you think it's going to take for us to get there? Yeah, That's a, it's a really good question. I mean, um, uh, it's a difficult one. There's some really st stunning work coming out of St. Jude's Children's Hospital in, in um, Tennessee. Is that where, where's Memphis? Yeah, Memphis, Tennessee. See, my American geography, I'm gonna pass my exam. Uh, um, stipulates that the bacteria in the respiratory tract can significantly alter your likelihood of being a propagator of infection and acquiring infection. Because uh, the virus, the, uh, the rhinovirus or the flu virus, can actually adhere to the, um, the mucous membrane on the outside of a bacteria with an extracellular polysaccharide that grows there. Um, and it allows it to transit outside the body and survive for a longer period of time. And um, working with ferrets, which are the best model for human respiratory diseases, um, you can actually augment that. So you can swap out a ferret's nasal passage, which has the wrong kind of bacteria, which promote viral infectivity, and replace them with very similar organisms, which outcompete them, um, but aren't virally mediated. The viruses won't stick to it. And if you did that, you could see a way of significantly reducing infection rates. Can we get to a stage where we manipulate the microbiome to somehow enhance um, the immune system response against viruses? I, you know, it's possible there's been some studies which have explored that phenomenon, but they are very early stages and we don't have any really good clinical data. Can we use viruses to kill off bad bacteria in the body, the opposite trajectory? Absolutely. And you know, we were talking about this earlier, 
there's you know, people in the room that are experts in this. Um, and there's a big push after the invention of antibiotics in the 1940s, the use of something called phage therapy to eradicate infection dropped off precipitously in the Western world. Um, and it's now um, enjoying a significant resurgence, right? Where uh, uh, people are actually starting to understand the potential ability of using phage to kill bacteria that are in a targeted way. And that's probably gonna have a much greater efficacy for um, human medical treatment. I think we have a question about that online. So Anne, do you have a question there? We have two questions from online um, viewers. The first question is from Carrie Lease. The question is, what does alcohol ingestion do to gut bacteria? Does it kill good and, back, good and bad bacteria alike, or are there tough, bad bacteria that are alcohol immune? Where's, where's Carrie? Carrie, I don't care. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't bring this stuff up to me. Um, Carrie's a member. He's an astronomer. Oh, is he? Is he? He's well, a JPL. So I did say astronomy looks like a pitiful science. Now he's tackling my favorite hobby. Um, <laughs> sorry, Carrie. Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, as far as we can tell, the moderate ingestion of alcohol is doesn't have a significant effect upon microbial diversity in the gut. Doesn't seem to have a significant effect upon the selection of one organism versus the other. Alcohol is a pretty universal killer, right? There are very few organisms that are. Um, are resistant to uh, dosing in alcohol, right? Most alcohol consumptions aren't that high. If you were a severe alcoholic, uh, then the physiological impact of that is significantly greater. And I'll wager that the microbiome could either be influenced by the effects of alcohol on the body, as the body's immune system starts to fail or be altered, changing what bacteria can survive in your body. Or, and probably also likely, um, uh, alcohol could have an impact, but probably only in the duodenum, so immediately after the stomach, right? Um, most alcohol will be absorbed way before it gets to the colon, I would assume, um, although my physiological understanding of that has been numbed by years of drinking it. Um, but that, that paradigm is definitely something which uh, we're really keen to explore. Um, lots more experiments are needed. Uh, second online question, Ian? The second question is from Brittany Sisson. Brittany is a microbiologist for Adaptive Phage Therapeutics, and she would like to know if the speaker's opinion on using bacteriophage for modulating the intestinal microbiome particularly in patients with gut motility issues that subsequently cause small intestinal bacterial overgrowths. Yeah, SIBO. Um, yeah, I, I did mention before that I, I strongly believe that's an important paradigmic changing area. There's an opportunity to have a big impact upon disease burden and to tackle diseases which antibiotics can't touch. So I fully support uh, the, the resurgence of phase therapy. Um, in SIBO, I, I, I honestly haven't seen any clinical data on that. Phage therapy for SIBO? Um, you guys have seen anything? Uh, it's a fantastic idea. SIBO is a small uh, intestinal uh, overgrowth, so bacteria coming up from the intestine and over um, uh, becoming very abundant in the small bowel. You can breathe out alcohol from the uh, fermentation products of these, of these organisms. Um, there was a guy who got pulled over and breathalyzed, um, and it was, it was because he had SIBO. I believe that's the story. And he was like, yeah, you're over the limit. I'm not drunk. Um, we've all bacteria. been there. We've all been there. Yeah. Exactly. It's my bacteria. It's the perfect excuse. Uh, don't worry, officer. I'm a microbiologist. Um, in that context, yes, I don't see why not. If you could find the right phage, I've got four people in the front row that could probably do that. Um, find the right phage, tackle that organism, and uh, knock it out. It probably would be much more effective than most of the existing therapies. Carl, our local phage <coughs> expert. Uh, uh, Extraordinary. Yes. Ask Carl. I'm, <laughs> I'm Carl Merrill, I'm a member, and also the, one of the founders of AT, a, APT, Adaptive yes. Phase Therapy. Uh, in that regard, um, I just do want to make a comment, and that is that I think the phage, because they can kill very specific bacteria, can totally open up the science here because they can kill off a suspected bacteria that might affect the microbiome. Without affecting any of the rest yes, of the ecosystem. Exactly. Yeah, targeted manipulation experiments. And we are actually doing that in um, bioreactors. Right. So to determine if that organism is doing that biochemical process is highly effective. And, and for the audience, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation made a wonderful movie that you can watch on the internet called The, the Perfect Predator, or The, 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 the World's Greatest Killer, I think it is, The Bacteriophage. And you'll see how specific it is. However, it has artistic license. So, in in the uh, in in the video, um, the the bacteria have teeth. I can assure you, there are no 
bacteria with teeth, and, and the bacterial viruses wiggle in a rather suggestive way, and I don't think <laughs> they do that either. But So the question I had uh, that, that um, I'm concerned about, I, I love the examples, but, but the one that uh, I'm concerned about is the, the example of the Hutterites and the Amish, because those are two inbred uh, communities and so you might have founder effects, and they might have quite significant different biochemical backgrounds. And so um, it, it, I, it would be nice if you could get them to exchange their environment and then yes. see that, or if you had a more outbred group that could live in two. And I just wondered yeah. you about your comment about and that. That's, that's that, you know, um, when we published that in New England Journal of Medicine, it was the primary concern, right, is the population, despite all the genetic, uh, so this is Carol Ober's work on the genetic profiling of those populations. <laughs> Sorry, I need more wine. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a major problem, right? We fully, we fully agree to it. Uh, the, the loci associated with asthma risk are uh, normalized across the population. There doesn't appear to be any genetic drift there. So we, we're reasonably happy that the inbreeding hasn't necessarily affected that. But you know as well as I do, a lot of different loci, a lot of different potential opportunities for manipulation. So what we're doing now is we're tackling that in new communities. Um, San Diego is a great experimental system. Uh, that's La Jolla. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. I live there. I have an office on the beach. I can't wax lyrical about it enough. Um, but just down the hill, um, closer to the border, we have a huge array of immigrant populations. Oh, you're amazing. Thank you. And... Um, and those immigrant populations have very, very different uh, asthma rates, despite um, a significant reduction in inbreeding. So these are outbred populations. Uh, so what we see in that population is um, communities coming from Mexico have very reduced levels of asthma development. Communities coming from El Salvador have very elevated levels of asthma development. Communities coming from Jamaica and the Caribbean have very reduced levels, from Belize, very elevated levels, and it fluctuates across those populations. The, the same is true epidemiologically in the home countries, um, and differentially true here. So by randomizing those populations and putting them into the same environmental context, we're actually able to deal with that genetic factor. But we need significantly larger numbers. So in the Amish and Hutterites, we're dealing with 20, 30 people. Yeah. <laughs> is that another rule? Oh, I got rules. I was going to trade it for a glass of wine. But. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, but uh, in the in those kind of populations, we need hundreds uh, to uh, up to 450, 500 people in the population. I believe we're on the uh, red microphone. My name is Scott Matthews. I'm a member. Uh, I apologize for asking you to sort of oversimplify what you've presented, but. If I want to have healthy bacteria, if I want a broad spectrum in my gut biome, yeah. should I stop washing my hands or should I be washing <laughs> no. my hands? <laughs> no, you don't. Um, so, number one, eat as many different plants. I said that at the beginning of the talk. 30 different species of plant a week will significantly increase the chemical and biological diversity of your stool. Now, whether that's related to health or not um, could be debated. But on the, uh, in all of our studies, that's correlated with an overall progressive of health. But health is very hard to define. Should you wash your hands? Um, I did a study with um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, the, uh, the presenter of a uh, NY, uh, uh, some New York radio thing called Radio Lab, right? Um, where I washed both their hands and then I uh, had them shake hands. Um, and then I track the, the colonization potential of the microbes on their hands, and then they wash hands again. Um, and after they wash hands, any signature from the previous interaction is gone, and their own microbiome reappears instantaneously. So all washing does is just removes the thin, very thin layer of film on your fingers, right? Your own, if you think of your skin like a city, like, like Manhattan, right? It's, it's a dense biosphere. The skin goes very deep. And the microbes are all the way down into the baseline, uh, the basal cells. So this, this has a rich, diverse microbial ecosystem. I, I tell kindergartners that there are uh, 50 billion bacteria on the average finger. And they love that number, right? You know, they're like, oh, it's the coolest thing. 50 billion, look. Um, and that, that is true. So it's a relatively true number based on biopsies. To get that number, you actually have to take skin plugs. So you actually have to punch the skin and take a deep plug and then do it repeatedly on somebody until you get an average across space. Dedicated graduate students at University of Chicago. 
<laughs> University of Chicago is where fun goes to die. This is being recorded, right? So I can say this out loud. Um, so we, ha we have people who are dedicated to their sciences. <laughs> the University of California, San Diego is different, but the people are very bright because they live by the ocean. They're very dedicated too. <laughs> Thank you very much. But I, I guess my mom was wrong and I was right because I always told her there's no point in washing your hands because they're just going to get dirty again. <laughs> So I think we're at the red microphone. Yeah. Will Angel, I am a member. Could you talk about the the tests and how much they cost and what those processes look like to get you know, to get one of these samples and actually sample it, as well as how much cheaper the tests have gotten and your efforts to make them even cheaper? Thank you. Right. So um, it's uh, I have a, I have a soapbox. I have enough soapboxes about that subject. I could build a house. Um, so I won't go on too many soapboxes. Uh, the 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 test that's normally used is uh, in clinical data. I won't talk about commercial products. So commercial products do exist, although I have a lot of questions about the validity of those products and what they actually provide. Um, there's one company that has something that's useful, but they're very specific about their outcomes. Everyone else is a bit too general. But in clinical settings, it's incredibly cheap now. Um, uh, to, we actually uh, can generate a metagenome, which is the sequencing of all the genetic information of all the microbes in a sample, uh, for about $80 a sample. So in a clinical setting, that's the, the, the providers actually ask us, can you add some costs onto that? There's not enough money. We can't claim. Um, so we <laughs> in fact, in one setting, they asked us to put up to $2,000 so we could claim it against insurance, because otherwise it's viewed as not negotiable. Anyway. Another setting. Um, in, in that context, uh, yeah, so it's incredibly cheap to do the test. The, the cost is not in the test. You're sequencing DNA is dirt cheap now, thanks to the development of next generation sequencing technologies. Uh, the cost is in the analysis. And people forget about that. Computer science um, is a neglected, and bioinformatics are a hugely neglected area um, uh, in most grants. So I see grants where they're like, we'll sequence the microbiome. What will you do with them? We'll do some statistical tests on them. <laughs> okay, how are you going to get from the microbiome to the statistical test? I, I'm, uh, oh, yeah, we'll have a bioinformatician do that, yeah, like, like a technician, you know? <laughs> no, you don't. Um, that's incredibly complicated, and, and if you screw it up, um, a massive problem for the analysis. So we're very, very clear on the fact that the costs for doing it are in the analytical pipeline. And there's huge strides forward in in machine learning and AI uh, that are being developed at the University of Chicago with uh, Rob Knight and, and various industrial colleagues and commercial organizations to try and drive forward um, a better understanding of automation of those processes so that we can get those cheaper, we can get them more high throughput, and we can have a bigger impact upon clinical costs um, and on the turnaround time. So sequencing's fine, but if it takes a week to analyze it, it's not much use. There's a fantastic guy up at University of California, San Francisco called Charles Chu, who's doing phenomenal work in this area using metagenomics to provide a probability that the infection uh, in a bloodstream, for example, is due to a virus or a bacteria. And his uh, success rates in terms of accuracy and prediction are incredibly high. Um, and that's clear certified um, uh, commercial apparatus. It's incredibly powerful. Um, in a clinical setting, that works really well. Blue microphone. Hello, my name is Jared McQueen. I am a, mem a member. Uh, fabulous talk. Uh, I was. My question is on fasting. So oh, you yes. talked about mice in both animal models and human models. Things you can put into the system that affects the gut microbiome. What happens when you restrict all calories? So intermittent fasting, or even like longer fasting, like the equivalent of a week or two in humans. How does that change the gut microbiome? Um, there's a, there's a brilliant uh, researcher at University of Pennsylvania whose name is not coming to the front of my brain, but he's an editor on my journal. He's done some phenomenal work in this space. Um, the best fast to use this as an example is, is the nightly fast that we all take, unless you eat in the middle of the night. Um, uh, as soon as you stop restrict, uh, restricting food into the colon, right, uh, the vast majority of the bacterial biomass in the colon uh, starts to die off. Uh, killed off by phages that are present in the in the gut virus and the bacteria, but also uh, just basically a cessation of growth. And so by the morning, you've lost about 80 to 90% of your biomass. And when you start eating breakfast, you start feeding that microbial engine again, and the biomass starts to increase. Those are averages based on 
uh, mouse work extrapolated to humans and some basic quantification in humans. Um, but the paradigm is true. I, look, I, I don't know how to answer your question effectively because I can't link it specifically to the potential health benefits associated with fasting. All I can say is I can, I can, I can be uh, hyperbolic, but I could also uh, make a hypothesis. Now, a hypothesis would be like this. Um, whenever you starve any system, you kind of reset it. Right? And there's a, uh, there is a paradigm around every single night we end up driving down the biomass and then building it back up. And therefore, what you eat for breakfast is potentially incredibly important, right? Because that drives what, what grows most effectively the following day. Um, uh, but the, the overall structure of that community is going to remain stable. Uh, there's a, there's a, a one study that was done that demonstrated it takes nine months on a new diet to significantly alter the stability of a new microbiome. Microbiome can fluctuate a little bit day to day, right? But if you want to take an obesogenic microbiome, a microbiome which when I take it out of a human, put it into a mouse, the mouse will get fat. If you want to make that into one that I take out of the human, put it into a mouse, and the mouse won't get fat. That takes nine months on a diet, uh, like a high fiber, whole grain diet. Right? So if um, instead of doing that, you could take a load of antibiotics, right, and then just start eating a high fiber diet and hope for the best. Or you could go on a intermittent fasting regimen where you're trying to reset it, knock back all the bacteria, and then eat healthily as you can in the, in the interim and drive up the abundance of those good bacteria. I have absolutely no evidence that that hypothesis is accurate or, or, uh, or, or valid. Um, but it's an interesting experiment that does need to be done. Um, and for the most part, um, I, I tried it. I got really, really hungry. Um, and then I, I, I got angry with people. Um, the lab told, uh, started bringing me uh, Milky Ways, and, and, you know, and I broke my fast. Um, I'm just not very good at it. Uh, I need constant food. But um, I admire people's gumption for doing it. It's, uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> Sorry. So we're, gonna, we're just going to have three more. There's a black microphone circulating somewhere. Then the red, then the blue. I'm sorry, we're we're getting late, so that's it. Uh, hi, but there, you can talk in the social hour. <coughs> uh, excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Name? So, are you a member? And your name? And my name is Vishwajit, and I'm not a member, but I'm a microbiologist. So my question is: uh, uh, Chronic helminth in infection has oh, yeah. any effect on the asthma uh, reduction? It's a statement more than a question. Yeah. <laughs> what is your opinion about So helminths, not microbes, but um, helminths, this is the idea that you put worms back inside the body in order to promote a healthy immune system response. Uh, there's been some trials, not particularly well conducted in my opinion, uh, that have suggested it's effective. Um, a lot of uh, N of 1 studies where people have sworn by it. Um, uh, but then, you know, if you ever watch uh, on Netflix, there's a new show by, by that lady called Goop. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things on that show which I don't agree with either. So um, I, I, I'm sure that uh, helminths and other arthropods um, and, and in, you know, uh, invertebrates that we, we lack exposure to now are probably um, missing from our immune repertoire and we should be exposed to them. I have no doubt about that. Um, should we start putting parasites back into people's intestines? I have a little bit of a problem with that. I haven't. I'd like to see a lot more evidence before I felt comfortable about making that preposition. Because in a situation like here, where everybody's got enough food at day to day, that's fine. Um, but helminths can cause uh, selective pressure on, on energy usage by an individual. And if kids aren't getting enough food, then that can accelerate problems associated with malnutrition. So I have issues uh, that are associated with that, right? That being said, you know, I also advocate for taking poop from somebody and putting it in. So, you know, like, you know, you can't trust me. But um, those are incredibly well screened poop samples. They screen out for all, all of the nasty things. Um, so, yeah, I think there's an interesting area of science that needs a lot more work. Thank you. All right, microphone. My name is Al Ehrlich. I am a member. And you, you talked about a microbiome influencing essentially neurological function, anxiety in a mouse and so on. Now, I believe there are groups of perfectly healthy mice, um, some of which solve problems, yes. like going through a maze, better than other groups. Yeah. Has anyone thought about using microbiome technology to make the dumber mice smarter? <laughs> I have. Um, 
uh, the, <laughs> we have some studies that we haven't published yet. So, um, right, uh, you, you guys can all be quiet, right? You're not going to tell anyone else? No. <laughs> you, tell, you lot as well? It's only going to be a YouTube video. Yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> no, uh, we did some work with Peggy Mason, who's a brilliant neurobiologist over at University of Chicago. Um, and we've done a little bit of work um, uh, in, in the behavioral lab uh, for the mouse lab that seems to suggest that um, uh, mouse behavior, mouse sociability uh, can be learned based on the microbiome. So if I, if, uh, if I was you know, Larry's friend and Larry was in a cage, I might go up to Larry and open the cage and let him out, right? But if I didn't like Larry, I'd probably walk around the cage and ignore him and let him rot in his cage. You know? um, we do this with mice. So we put a, cage, a mouse in a cage in, a, in an arena and then we let the mouse in. Um, if, the mouse, if the mice grew up together, they'll always help each other 90% right, of the time. If they don't grow up together, if they don't know each other, they will ignore each other. And you know, the mouse will stay in the cage, and the other one will walk around the outside of the arena. If we take the microbiome from a helper mouse and put it into a non-helper mouse, that non-helper mouse becomes a helper mouse. So we can transfer the phenotype of that behavioral response, the social behavioral response, um, uh, between animals by simply transferring the microbiota. Now, why? There's a lot to unpack there we don't understand. Maybe it's pheromones, maybe it's smell. Maybe it's uh, other recognition factors. But it works both ways. If you swap out the microbiome in the caged animal, uh, you can have the same effect. So there's something going on there that we can't necessarily unpick. But uh, this is akin to an animal end of one study, right? If we take a rat that's learned to maze, and we take the microbiome out of the rat that learned the maze, and we put it into a rat that hasn't learned to maze, it will learn it significantly faster than a naive rat. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I want to repeat that study like a thousand more times before I ever publish it. But um, it's incredibly compelling science, right? Yeah. So a real opportunity. Now, uh, of course, that lends a huge number of things. So should we interfere with people's learning ability? I think people with learning disabilities, and my son has learning disabilities, I think that could be valuable, right? Um, and people just to advance social fabric of the community, Go and watch the film Gattaca um, and then tell me if it's a good idea, right? You know, uh, uh, it could cause a significant social imbalance, the haves and the have nots. So I, I worry about those kind of things all the time. The ethics of that scientific paradigm need to be investigated a lot more effectively. Thank you. Last question Blue microphone. So does that prove that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach? Sure, why not? Yeah, sure. It's Valentine's Day, right? And vice working? versa? Sorry, Larry, this uh, microphone's not working. Hi, I'm Naomi. I'm, it's my first meeting. Um, I also had a question about the microbome, mic microbiome. Boom, thank oh, you. Right. Right. Everyone gets it wrong. <laughs> Affecting the gut yeah. um, to the neurological process. Does this mean from what we know, because it sounds like it's relatively new, I'm not sure, because they haven't really um, gone ahead and done more, it sounds like, with this study, since we're thinking in the future there might be probiotics for depression and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if they're on the path to thinking that it can affect the dopamine levels in the brain and that's how it's affecting depression states. Yeah. And also, um, if that is the case, would this also mean that ingesting things by breathing and uh, that this would affect all that and this would depend location to location, city yeah. to city, that people would feel happier or more depressed because of that and also since they're concerned with the gut uh, bacterial interactions and all of this have they actually tried to flood the body in other areas not just the gut with these types of microbiomes and sure. bacteria uh, yeah, a lot to unpack there but I, li I like the paradigm right um yeah that's could be the reason why everyone in boston is grumpy right <laughs> they're breathing in the wrong kind of stuff um, or it's just the Red Sox lost. Um, the, uh, the context there is, 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 is difficult, right? I, I have no evidence to support the fact that what you breathe in influences the, um, the gut-brain axis, which appears to be the fundamental way in which bacteria affect behavior. I don't have any evidence to support that. 
just like in the Amish, where the, what you breathe in affects the immune system, which affects what grows here, which affects uh, the lung, it's entirely feasible. It's just we haven't figured that out yet. Um, but you know, uh, down the line, that, that could explain a lot of things. I mean, we talked about um, mold growth in buildings, right? And uh, the potential for that to cause. But it can cause depression. It can cause malaise. Maybe uh, the chemicals being released or the microbial stimulants are having an effect, right? Um, again, hypothesis, hypothesis, hypothesis. No fundamental evidence to support it. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, can we use, I think you're suggesting like a fecal microbiome transplant where we cure someone's gut. Can we do that for other parts of the body? There are vaginal transplants being done now uh, to cure like uh, a persistent uh, bacterial vaginosis. Um, the, the studies are very early. Uh, the uh, cohort sizes are very small and the results are very variable. Uh, so I would argue potentially not, but it seems like it could, it could be a valuable thing, right? Um, there's a lot of work on going um, trials ongoing looking at the potential to take a, a vaginal microbiota and colonize it into children born C-section, right? So we call this a, a vaginal a seeding of the baby, which would have happened as they passed through the birth canal. Um, but interestingly, uh, when we look at babies that are um, born uh, with the amniotic sac is ruptured and they are in the birth canal, but then they are removed from the, uh, the, uh, the cesarean um, uh, surgery, uh, versus born vaginally, versus um, uh, being removed without the amniotic sac breaking, without entering into the birth canal. Um, the only biggest difference is you have to pass through the birth canal. Um, and we think it's not the birth canal that's having the birth canal microbiota that's having the impact. We think it's the potential interaction with the fecal microbiota of the mother as you pass from the birth canal. I don't know if you realize, but the ex exit of the birth canal is quite near to the exit for the gastrointestinal system, and the baby passes real close. Anyone that's ever been at a birth, a lot of times there's a lot of colonization potential. Um, and we think that actually has a bigger role to play in colonization of the baby's gastrointestinal system in the early phases of life than the, than the, the vaginal tract. But again, lots of data, um, not a lot that's conclusive. It's very early science. There are some groups looking at skin microbiome transplants. Um, some brilliant work from Richard Gallo at the University of California, San Diego, who's demonstrated that you can um, cure eczema um, or eradicate the uh, symptomology of eczema by swapping out bacteria on the surface of the skin. Um, certain bacteria produce antibiotics, which kill off the disease-causing organisms. And so you can actually reduce the efficacy of it. And so there's a huge amount of work, uh, but I have yet to see a oral rinse to get rid of the oral microbiome or alter that, but I'm sure someone's gonna come up with that at some point, um, but no clinical evidence. Well, thank you very much for a great talk, Jack. <laughs> and before you go, I wanna present you with this uh, couple of gifts from the Philosophical Society. Um, one is the volume one of the PSW Bolton from 1871 that sets out why the society was founded and who founded it and why they named it Philosophical Society. And the other is a, a framed copy of the announcement of your talk signed by all of the members of the General Committee on behalf of all of the members. And thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> And before we return to the social hour, we have a few housekeeping announcements, which I'm going to try to go through very, very quickly. So forgive me if I talk really fast. If you're a member and you haven't paid your 2019, 2020 dues, please do so. And whether you have paid your dues or you have not paid your dues, please consider making an additional donation, sponsoring a lecture, or sponsoring a lecture series, and volunteering to help carry out the society's activities. As we do more things and have more cameras and have more cables to lay and have more videos to edit and have more speakers to bring, um, we need more people to help us do it. So if you are interested in lending a hand, please let me know. If you're not a member, please join. You can apply for membership on the PSW website. I think probably everybody's seen this slide, but basically, you just need to go to the homepage on the PSW website, click the join button, and follow the screens, and your membership application will be processed in a couple of days. And if you have a genuine interest in science, you will be admitted to membership. It's just $75 a year. 
PSW is a nonprofit educational organization tax exempt under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code and contributions are tax deductible to the extent permitted by the IRS and the law. All PSW members in good standing may wear a PSW rosette. If you wish to purchase one, it's $15 plus tax, you may do so at the rosette table at the back of the room. And Ann will be happy to take care of that for you. Our next lecture, oops, there we go. Our next lecture will be the annual president's address. It will be the 2420th meeting of the society. It will be on February 21st. And the speaker will be, I always fail to pronounce this correctly, Joachim Frank, professor of biochemistry and molecular biophysics and of biological sciences at Columbia University and distinguished professor of the State University of New York at Albany. He is the inventor and developer of single particle cryo-electron microscopy and methods for cryo-EM determination of molecular structures at atomic resolution. He was awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this work together with Jacques Dubuchet and Richard Henderson. And he will be speaking on it, single particle cryo-electron microscopy, revolutionary methods for determining molecular structure. A lecture is sponsored by Mill and White, Solano and Brannigan. After Frank's lecture, we have number 2421 on March 6th. The speaker will be Rajesh Rao, and he is the Jia and Elizabeth Yoon Wang Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Director of the Neurosystems Laboratory at the University of Washington in Seattle. He'll be speaking on when AI joins the human brain, brain co-processors for restoring and augmenting human function. And this lecture is sponsored by PSW member Adarsh Deepak. Number 2422 will be on March 20th. The speaker is Henrik Christensen, professor of engineering and director of the Contextual Robotics Institute at the University of California at San Diego. He'll be speaking on a subject related to robotics. And the lecture is sponsored by PSW science member Erica Kane, who's here in the audience. Uh, we have not determined who the speaker will be for April 3rd. The 2424 lecture on April 17th will be Wendy Friedman. She's a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago. She'll be speaking on measuring the Hubble constant and the fate of the universe. So don't want to miss that one. Uh, and the subject is really timely because there are some competing methods for determining the Hubble constant and the, the values that they've come up with are not exactly the same. So there's some debate about who's wrong, who's right, what the real value should be, and what hinges on it is whether or not inflation is the correct model for the early universe. But we'll get to that. On May 1st, the 2425th meeting, we'll hear from Rob Bertram, who's the chief scientist for food safety at USAID. He's going to talk about golden rice. I highly recommend to everybody to come and talk, to hear this talk. It's a really important talk on societal issues that relate to uh, genetically modified plants and their ability to uh, help people and uh, how we deal with proving that they're safe and how do we deal with the fears that people have about them. And then we have the Henry dinner and address on May 15th, the 2426th meeting. And the speaker will be Shep Dolman, who was the founder and director of the Event Horizon Telescope Consortium. He's an astronomer at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and a senior research fellow at Harvard University. And he'll be talking about taking pictures of black holes. Actually, the event horizons of the black holes. Black holes are black and you can't really take pictures of them. This lecture is sponsored by Mellon White, Solano, and Brannigan. <clears throat> Finally, let's have a nice round of applause for the people who manned everything tonight. <clears throat> the social hour ends promptly at 1030. We might stay a few minutes extra. Please use the side entrance to exit the building. And I will now accept a motion for adjournment of the 2419th meeting. A second. 
All members in favor? All members opposed? Hey, who, throw that guy out. <laughs> this meeting is now adjourned to the social hour. Thank you all for coming.